So um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Sabrina Pavoloni. I'm the president of the Society of Government Economists. And I want to welcome you to this, uh, our virtual seminar series, the, US, the use of data analytics and data science in policy analysis. And before we get started, I just wanted to make a few announcements uh, about some upcoming events. Uh, so first we have our annual conference coming up on April 20th, and that will be at American University Washington College of Law. Um, the registration should be open probably within uh, two weeks and it'll be on our website. Uh, also, we have the call for papers out for the SGE at ASSA 2024 annual meetings. Uh, the deadline to propose individual papers or sessions of four papers and four discussions is May 5th. You can also find that on the website. Um, and the meetings will be in San Antonio, Texas this year. And lastly, we are accepting nominations for the board of directors. Um, the deadline for that is March 10th. Again, there is an announcement on the website. Uh, and you can contact elections at SGE. Dot econ, um, hyphen econ.org um, to uh, apply for the elections. And those will be held in March. Um, and those who are members are eligible to vote. Okay, so with that, I want to stop and turn the floor over to Steve Payson, who will be our chair. Hi, thanks so much. So uh, I'll just uh, start by sharing the screen. Um, actually, let me just open something up real quick first. Okay. I just wanted to uh, start by saying that uh, the session is organized by Airleap. Uh, for those who are not uh, that familiar with Airleap, um, now, can can you see my shared screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, it we're very easy to get to. It's uh, airleap.org. Airleap stands for the Association for Integrity and Responsible Leadership in Economics and Associated Professions, and uh, we've been collaborating with SGE for about uh, fifteen years in uh, participating in SGE conferences and and happy hours and all kinds of things. So we're very easy to get to, just check us out. Uh, and in the About Us section, we have uh, things about be, being a member and, and helping us out. So if you're interested in integrity and responsible leadership in economics, <laughs> you know, uh, just check out our website if you haven't already. Okay, so uh, back to uh, what we're here for, which is um, this, uh, um, webinar. Okay, I just wanted to give a brief uh, rundown on what you can expect. Okay, there's uh, my brief introduction, which is happening as we speak, as I speak. <laughs> and then uh, we'll have uh, four papers, uh, one by uh, Willie uh, Jasso and Mark Rosenzweig on uh, using DHS administrative data to address basic scientific and policy questions in migration research. I'll then be the discussion discussant for the paper. That will be followed by a paper by Julia Pouchander. Uh, it's going to be on funding climate justice, taxation transfers, and green bonds. Uh, Marvin uh, Hokema will be discussing that paper. The third paper by Arirat Kishka and uh, Jalen Lee and Irina Amari will be on data-driven investigation on impact of air quality in different demographics. Uh, that'll be discussed by Scott Gilbert. And uh, finally, the fourth paper by Brian Sloboda and uh, Rolando Santos will be a long, short-term memory <laughs> approach to forecast the macroeconomic impacts of COVID-19 uh, and G20 uh, countries. And that'll be discussed by Sandeep uh, Sarika. Now, um, we've got a bunch of papers, a bunch of discussants. So um, two hours may seem like a lot of time, but it could go quickly. So 
Uh, the plan in general is to have everyone's uh, paper presented and discussed first, and then we should have a nice half an hour or so for questions for the audience. So what I'd like people to do, since it is a big crowd, is to kind of hold back a little bit, take notes on your questions, and then when we come to the end, it's an open question about any one of the any one of the four papers. Okay, so uh, with that, um, I think we can uh, start with the first paper by uh, with Willie Jasso being the presenter. And so I'm going to uh, stop sharing. And um, uh, Willie, can can you uh, bring up your your paper? Oh, by the yeah. way. Uh, each paper presenter has about 15 minutes to present. I use the range of 14 to 16 minutes, and then each discussion is about six minutes or five to seven minutes. Okay. All right. Perfect. Setting up here. Okay. One second. Sorry, a little glitch getting my, getting this to, to be a, there we go, there we go. All right, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be with you today. Uh, I have a lot of slides, as Steve knows, and basically what I'm going to do is skip a lot of them to get to the good stuff. But the ones that I'm skipping, I'm relying on your eyes to remember that there's lots of things happening in between the main slides. So. Um, let's see, um, here we go. The objective, as Steve said, is to use DHS administrative data to create a new public use database on lawful permanent residents and their children uh, and shed light on fundamental questions, etc. So this is the overview. The first two bullet items I'm basically going to skip, but you have to know that underlying this there is a framework for studying migration and very importantly, a US immigration context. If we were doing this in another country, it would be very, very different. A little thing on building blocks and I'll go quickly through that to get to the seven substantive questions that I want to show you, I believe can be answered with DHS data. Now, for each of those questions, two points at the outset. One is, there's many ways to skin a cat, and there's many ways. So I, I, I propose looking at some forms, doing this, doing that. I vary this across questions. The idea being that there's more than one way to do it. We may want redundancy in the end, et cetera. Moreover, moreover, only DHS knows what is plausible, what is feasible. Mark and I see our task as pointing uh, uh, to some, some questions that can be answered with administrative data, and then the ball is in the DHS court. So the framework, and as I said, I'm gonna go very, very fast. Um, uh, there's four central questions, and this is what they are about the migrant, about it progress over time, et cetera, three central actors, the migrant, and also importantly, other people at both origin and destination. And so we're going to be looking at DHS data and we're gonna do two kinds of things. Today, only percentages and counts for LPR cohorts, but there's enough administrative data to estimate real multivariable models bringing in things like personal characteristics, educational history, occupational history, marital history, et cetera. Um, and of course, we can always add to the data set uh, country conditions, because these can be linked via the, the country variables for the immigrants in the DHS data. US immigration, did that suddenly get big for you? No, okay, it got big for me, so I'm gonna, Let's see what it is did it get big for us. Okay, it did get big for you. Yes. All right. This has never happened to me before. We are in <laughs> new territory. Uh, let's see if my hand might work. Yes. All right. 
Good. Um, so there's four types of foreign born in the US. And the key here is that this database, at least at this point, the division is to include only legal permanent residents. Um, now this is a, uh, uh, a, a mock-up of uh, what we know from DHS and census. I won't bore you with the fact that there's a discrepancy of about 4 million foreign born each year between DHS data and census data. If we try to reconcile them, this is what we get. And my only point here is that if we only look at LPRs, then we are covering 70% of the foreign born population. So it's not bad. Now, historically, how many LPRs come a year? About a million, obviously much lower in the, during the pandemic. There's pathways. We don't have time to look at those pathways and you probably all uh, have heard of some of these, the, the ways that people get green cards. A key here is that over half of all new LPRs are already living in the US, all right? So that's important to keep in mind. Um, something about their rights, why it's important to look very seriously at LPRs. And so now we get to the building blocks. DHS produces every year an LPR file everyone who got LPR that year, and an annual naturalization file, everyone who naturalized. A key element in all of this is the A number or alien number, which is assigned to each foreign born person. And this will be the linchpin that permits linking from LPR file to naturalization file and to all the other databases that arise from the forms that people must fill out every time that they approach the immigration service. Uh, we're gonna look at some of those forms and then the essential resources, the law, of course, the USCIS policy manual, DHS reports, critically important, including what I consider an indispensable table in the DHS statistical yearbooks, uh, my students can tell you lots of stories about that. They, they learn that. Okay, these are only some of the forms. There's lots and lots of forms. You can go to the website and see all the forms. And each form is presented on the USCIS website in a beautiful way. There's an introductory page with some key facts, including the fee, for example. And then there's a clickable PDF set of instructions and then a clickable PDF actual form. And by the way, DHS is in the process of trying to convert many of these forms to be filed electronically. But, but this is what we have, key forms. I'm also going to bring in a little information from the new immigrant survey, which was a federally funded longitudinal survey of new LPRs and their, and their children, I'll skip all the other stuff about it that's easy to get on the web and get to these seven substantive questions. And Steve, I will rely on you to tell me when I have two minutes left. Sure. Uh, so here's the first question. Among new LPRs sponsored as spouses of US citizens, what proportion are sponsored by native born US citizens? Now, this is a question that has no basis in law. That is, the law doesn't care. Uh, sponsoring a spouse is a privilege of US citizens, sponsoring outside the numerical limitations. But there is lots of interest, both scientific and policy about this. Look at the current knowledge. At the present time, we only know the answer to this question for three cohorts, and you see the years uh, 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 and the data sources. Um, but there's a way that this question can be answered very easily. And as you see here, the, the basic form that we rely on is this petition for alien relative submitted by the sponsor. And then this slide at the bottom shows the links, how to get from the LPR file, the alien relative file, how to see, how to discern the nativity of the sponsor. Okay, it's all there. Second question. Among new LPRs with conditional LPR, 
what proportion successfully have the restrictions removed and what proportion become deported. It turns out that some LPRs get LPR for a period of only two years, and then they have to file to remove who are these people. These are the ones who are spouses and children from a marriage of less than two years duration at the time that LPR is conferred, plus a small number of entrepreneur, employment-based immigrants who then have to come back and show that they actually invested and that new jobs actually were created, et cetera. The point here in this slide is that simply looking at the file, this form I-751 petition to remove the conditions on residents won't answer the question, why? Because immigration law is complicated and it turns out that there's a process for certain conditional LPRs to have the conditions removed without filing for my 751. And they have to be married to a special kind of US citizen spouse, regularly stationed abroad, doing something for the US, including research for universities, by the way. So it turns out that if you look at figures, et cetera, you get different estimates between looking at the 751 only and looking at it jointly with naturalization. Third question, among new adult LPRs, new is critical here, what proportion sponsor the immigration of relatives? They're only allowed to sponsor, new LPRs are only allowed to sponsor a spouse or an unmarried child of any age. And then how many do they sponsor? There's some information currently, but I have not seen anyone actually produce estimates from the new immigrant survey for 2004. But the HS data can, can answer this question. And again, this slide shows what form you need to use and what the links are and proposes some steps for you're going to be linking the A number from one file to another file, locate the, the type of relative, et cetera. Fourth question. For each LPR cohort, what proportion acquires citizenship through naturalization? And at how many years post LPR? Through naturalization is really important here because as you'll shortly see, there's a second way to acquire citizenship. Acquiring it through naturalization requires that the LPR be 18 years of age. And there's other requirements, obviously eligibility requirements, residence requirements, et cetera. I won't go into them, uh, but this is a question that has been of very great interest for many, many, many years, starting with the Select Commission of, on Immigration and Refugee Policy uh, back in, in 1980 and 1981. And this slide shows you how to get these numbers. Now, of course, Every time that this has been tried, uh, there's, there's some data problems, all right? There's always errors, mispunches, et cetera. But this, this provides a blueprint for addressing that question. Now, question five, what proportion acquires citizenship by deriving it from a parent and at how many years post LPR? So under the Child Citizenship Act of 2000, uh, a child born outside of the U.S., blah, 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 uh, can automatically become a U.S. citizen if, and here are the conditions, and I don't have time to read them, but you're going to see them in action in a minute, because this produces two types of cases. One is the case where the, the, the child gets citizenship automatically at admission to LPR immediately. The second case is automatic citizenship when an LPR parent naturalizes, okay? So then there's a difference, there's a, 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 a new slide for each of these two cases. And here for case one, I propose that the easiest way to find out uh, who is obtaining this automatic citizenship at LPR is to use a form related to the, the, the requirement that an affidavit of support be filed for each immigrant. This is the request for exemption 
And this, this has a basis in law, obviously. And so this slide lays out exactly uh, uh, how you can do it this way, which seems to me to be the easiest way to do it. And incidentally, there is wide interest in the number of these derivative citizens, okay? We don't know. There's footnotes in virtually every report from DHS that says we're only, we're only providing figures on naturalization because we don't know about the derivative citizens, okay? Uh, the second case, for an LPR child, say who comes with two LPR parents, the moment that one of those two LPR parents naturalizes, the child, if still under 18, unmarried, living in the custody, blah, blah, uh, of the parent, gets automatic citizenship. I've had students in my classes who've said, oh, I'm a derivative citizen. And it was great because they didn't have to study for the test. Oh, two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. Six question, what proportion remain in lawful status? That's as an LPR or a citizen. At 10 year points past LPR with some little fudging there. 10 year points because there is a requirement that the green card, be, which is the evidence of LPR, be renewed every 10 years. And so there's a special form, I-90. And so this slide tells you how to link the information in that file obviously using the information on whether they've become a citizen through either naturalization or, or deriving it from parents. And the only thing I'll, I'll highlight here is at the very bottom that there's limitations of this approach. One is that citizens may reside outside the US. So they remain in lawful status and they can vote from abroad, et cetera, but it doesn't answer the question who is physically in the, U in the US. And the second limitation is that death is not taken into account. And that's something that, that needs to be thought about. Obviously the national death index is the natural place. Seventh and last question, uh, among adult foreign born US citizens, see this is going to be different from the LPRs, what proportion sponsor the immigration of relatives? And it lists all the relatives that they can sponsor and how many relatives do they sponsor? As you can see from all the lines, this requires many more pieces of information from the petition for alien relative. And then this lays out the, the uh, links and that does it. You, you obtain the estimate. All right, there are many more questions of great interest. Steve has seen a few of them, um, <laughs> but, I, but I will stop here with these seven. This is what we looked at today. I thank you very much and look forward to Steve's comments and to all of your questions and comments. Thank you. And Great, now, thanks so much. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Willie. So I'm going to start sharing. Uh, let's see, here I am. Okay, can you see my uh, thing there? Okay. So, um, uh, so I had uh, just a few comments and um, we're a little behind the schedule because we started a little late. So I'm going to cut some of my time <laughs> for the discussion. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Whoops. Okay. So um, as you can see here in this slide, uh, by the way, you were able to see the slide, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, I wrote down the, the seven questions. Uh, for each, you know, so L LPR is lawful permanent residence uh, or legal permanent residence. You've got, a, you know, a fascinating list of uh, very important questions. Um, and uh, one thing that I thought about is uh, the extent to which uh, DHS can release information on these. Of course, you know, there's a lot of privacy issues with any information on any individual uh, resident. So, uh these are all questions that uh you could provide they could provide summary statistics on you know um i don't know uh you know how much that would weaken any kind of analytical capabilities but there's always a major issue with any you know any uh data release you know by an agency you know whether any privacy is 
you know, uh, not maintained. So that's an important uh, factor. And then uh, there were other things that you mentioned uh, in other questions. We, you didn't have time to, you know, discuss them <laughs> in your presentation. But uh, one issue was that these would be on the individual single observations, which is uh, you, you were talking about uh, people in the paper, you're talking about people's five-year address history, five-year occupational history, marital history, and things like that, which uh, would be a little more difficult to, um, to, you know, to get from DHS. But anyway, I had some very general questions. Um, you know, I know, well, first of all, let me say that it's an amazing paper because it goes so deep into all the weeds and all the homework and all the details on how, you know, DHS can do all these things to provide these data. So I thought that was, you know, very impressive, very interesting. Um, you know, if I were at DHS and I was, uh, you know, uh, you know, at US uh, CIS and I asked to uh, come up with these variables, I'd be so grateful that all the homework was done for me <laughs> in terms of, you know, what I'd have to dig through to get through these things. Um, so, uh, so I just have more just sort of broader the kind of like blue sky questions. Um, you know, the, the, and maybe I can yield some of my time if you want to, you know, quickly, you know, address them or something, you know, really. So my, it, the first sentence of the paper is this, this paper develops a framework for using administrative data collected from DHS to address basic scientific and policy questions in migration research. But I didn't see, you know, too many, uh, too much discussion on, you know, these kinds of questions other than this is the question we want answers to, but the policy and scientific implications of the question aren't quite obvious. So to me, and I was thinking about this, maybe um, there's two general areas, you know, of why we want this inf this kind of information generally. One is to predict uh, the effect of immigration on uh, the economy or on any other social, you know, uh, th uh, demography and any kind of patterns that we're seeing you know, uh, the immigration causing. And another uh, area might be the extent to which the uh, immigration, specific immigration laws and policies may may be affecting, you know, how many immigrants, you know, become legal residents and that kind of thing. So to me, those are kind of like the general two areas. I don't know which one, you know, might seem more if they're missing something um, so that's that's one kind of you know comment I had. Um, so my other big question is, you know, I actually worked in DHS <laughs> for a year. I was in the ICE. I was just, you know uh, chief economist in ICE for a year, um, and that wasn't that long ago. Uh, of course, not USCS, but ICE has plenty of its own data. But um, you know, uh, there is a process and procedure for how uh, the government might want to build a new database for use for people. So, you know, uh, the from my experience, DHS is not quite like the Census Bureau, which has a mission to produce data to provide to researchers. <laughs> their, their mission is more like, you know, catching people at, and putting them where they have to go. So uh, so I don't know how this, I'm just wondering if there's been any sort of history, has there been any communication with you and your co-author with officials at USCIS? Is there any interest in, in, uh, in you know, uh, it, within DHS itself in doing this? And if so, what, what you know, the, have they said? So um, yeah, so those are my only uh, questions. If you wanna take like a minute or two, a couple of minutes to, you know, uh, address thank any you. of them. Yeah, I you're would, welcome. I would love to thank you. Uh, very, very quickly, an example of a policy question is uh, the, the, the question about visa wastage. We don't know how many people emigrate. And the, the numbers, the ceilings are set by Congress after deep reflection on what we might call carrying capacity and, and successful integration, et cetera. If it turns out that a third uh, of all LPRs are leaving, as they did, for example, in the 19th century, well, then that enables that ceiling to be set higher because we expect more to leave. An example of a scientific question is uh, 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 mate, mate selection. 
how do people find their mates? Do they find them in the US or in other countries? We know that when we have a big presence abroad in certain countries, military, for example, we get a lot of immigrants from those countries. And right. then uh, uh, USCIS itself is very, very keen on obtaining an estimate of the derivative citizens. And, and, and I, I could go on through every one of these questions, but I think that's enough for now. Oh, no, now, thanks. To second, to your second very important question. Uh, no, um, uh, we've been doing this out of curiosity, all right? And also because we've worked for a very long time. I, I worked at INS uh, for two years before I went to work uh, at the Select Commission on Immigration and Refugee Policy, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, related to that, um, to the best of my knowledge, and others, others in the room may know better than, than I, Every piece of immigration legislation has included in it a requirement that there be research on certain facets, what is happening as a result of this. Um, it, that was in part the idea behind the enormous part that INS and then DHS played in the development of the new immigrant service. The new immigrant survey would not have occurred were it not for that active participation in planning, in thinking about it, you know, what, how, how to stratify the sample, how to draw the sample, et cetera, and without providing INS and then the DHS providing the sampling frame from which we mm -hmm. drew the respondents. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, but, but I- No, thanks, that's very interesting. Okay, yeah. Thank no, you. thanks so much. Thank you yeah, very much. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, that's great. Okay, all right, thanks. So I'll, I'll move on to the next uh, paper and uh, that would be Julia. Um, and she's gonna be pre presenting on funding, climate justice, taxation and transfers and green bonds. Uh, Julia, do you have uh, your, um, did I stop sharing? I think I did, right? <laughs> Can you put, oh, great, thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Steve Pace, Narira Chikra, and Sabrina Wolf-Pabellionia uh, for the Society of Governmental uh, Economists uh, panel and the invitation to speak uh, on, on this uh, event on the use of data analytics and data science in policy analysis. And um, I would love to speak a bit about uh, an ongoing research uh, interest of mine on uh, climate change and uh, especially finding the funds for climate justice uh, in terms of taxation transfers and uh, green bonds. And when we look uh, at this graph that uh, maps the world surface temperature and normalies from 1891 on, we definitely see an upwards trend of uh, global warming. Um, uh, but my particular research focuses on the disparate impact of climate change uh, in order to make the case that for uh, climate justice to be enacted, we potentially uh, should start thinking about uh, transferring uh, some of the economic uh, gain prospects of a warming globe. And uh, this is also connected uh, to the uh, United Nations conferences of the parties that are currently really uh, discussing uh, what, uh, what redistribution mechanisms are are there uh, in the world in order to uh, help alleviate and mitigate and adapt to climate change in areas that are hit the worst, the hardest, and the fastest. So my model uh, starts with country temperature differences around the world. We also have different GDP compositions around the world. We have uh, different uh, compositions of agriculture, service, and industry sector, productivity in economic terms around the world. And then there is in the literature, especially the agriculture literature, um, uh, there is this top temperature for productivity per GDP sector. And with these factors, the country differences uh, in, in a starting ground on climate GDP composition uh, for productivity and the top temperature for productivity, you can start mapping out what are the expected time horizons until a country reaches peak condition by climate for economic productivity. 
And in this uh, graph, I first show the greener the country, uh, the more the country has time ahead until 2021. Uh, this is mapped um, uh, in terms of economic productivity and peak condition. And the redder the country becomes, uh, the less time ahead uh, this country has in terms of the best economic output uh, conditions under climate change. And then when you also plot this uh, in, in bar charts, so on the left side, you only have one third of the green countries have the most time ahead, and one third of uh, the all countries in the data set are uh, colored in red that have the least time ahead. But when you then also graph it uh, in the uh, uh, right bar chart, by one third of the expected economic gains from a warming globe. You see this green bar shifts up. So only a few countries have the prospect of really gaining uh, from climate change in the next um, 100 years uh, a lot. And um, the climate injustice that is inherent in this finding is also that we already now see that these countries that are climate change winners on the short uh, horizon uh, that they also have higher greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we already now see climate induced migration into these climate uh, winning territories. And we see uh, financial inflows in these uh, climate winners, but no outflows in terms of remittances. So, so we, do, we do have this uh, climate injustice. And uh, you can start with thinking uh, about ethics of redistribution. We already have this in uh, philosophers like Immanuel Kant, who says you should only engage in an action that you also want to have incurred onto you. Hans Jonas applies this on the environment as well. John Rawls, under uh, his whale of the ignorance condition, also says uh, that you should only um, uh, analyze every ethical predicament uh, by thinking about uh, the the uh, implications, but not considering if you're a, a, a if you have gains or losses to expect. Nicholas Caldor also applies this in his compensation criteria, and we have Dimitri Nicolin also applying this onto uh, the climate justice agenda. So you have this ethical grounding in redistribution, but then the political reality is when you only plot GDP uh, uh, prospects per inhabitant under climate change, when you plot this in this graph that we have here, and you see that the greener the country, the more the country uh, should be paying into red uh, areas around the equator belt. You see also political realities that play a role. And we see this right now in the conferences of the parties that you always have also political um, have issues. And so my project then really started focusing on uh, different redistribution criteria, what countries have a higher responsibility to act, and what countries have a better starting ground in finding solutions for a common climate taxation and green bond solution. So in uh, the, the final part of my presentation, I want to present the results of nine different indices where I factor in geo impacts of climate change for First, then think about resilience, finance, but also finance diplomacy um, that would uh, give the prospect what countries uh, have a higher responsibility to protect from climate change and redistribute some of the expected economic gains to uh, losing territories. So in the first set of index indices, I look into the geo impact of climate change. And when I start plotting together these uh, expected climate change uh, economic gains and losses um, and uh, CO2 emissions, so who is causing the problem you see here in this, uh, this uh, chart, the red country and the yellow country, but also the lighter green country uh, has, has the highest CO2 emissions and the highest uh, the climate change gain uh, prospects in economic terms. And therefore, uh, these countries have, uh, I argue, a higher responsibility to protect and redistribute some funds, potentially collect the funds via a green taxation and then redistribute it uh, over a climate bond solution. And these bonds could pay out funds in uh, countries that are colored really dark green. And uh, these countries in dark green could also raise the funds by climate bonds and shift some of the uh, burden of raising funds in order to mitigate and adapt to climate change to future generations. 
In the second index, I also uh, integrate climate flexibility, and this I see uh, as a future wealth of nations. I therefore use data on the different temperature zones that a country can offer. And I make this economic argument that this is actually a trade asset. The more climate zones you have, you can go skiing, uh, you, can, uh, you can go swimming in an ocean um, uh, in one country. And in other countries, you only have one flat uh, climate zone. You do have different uh, trade uh, prospects. And therefore, uh, I, I uh, make this argument that these countries that have a high climate flexibility should also be facing a higher uh, burden to protect the earth from climate change. And here again, you see the red country and the yellow uh, and light green countries uh, in this index have a higher responsibility to protect and redistribute some of the expected gains um, uh, due to CO2 emissions into areas that are losing out from climate change. And the third index, I also factor in climate change, uh, CO2 emission changes over time. And here you see uh, uh, the US a country that was uh, in, in the first two indices are supposed to be paying into the, the solution uh, shifts from being a, a payment country into a country that would receive uh, funds. Uh, so you could set this economic incentive for a country uh, that the economic uh, CO2 emission changes over time really also play a role. And with this, you could set incentives that countries shift from emitting a lot of CO2 and therefore uh, then uh, uh, receive funds. In the second uh, set of indices, I want to see uh, what historic differences countries have in uh, pooling financial means uh, in order to alleviate uh, big crises. And here I use data from uh, the Yale School of Management, uh, the metric uh, Schmelzig uh, database. It's a historical database on what countries have uh, a good starting ground uh, in, in terms of financial crisis intervention tools. Uh, in the database, you have uh, a really historic long-term prospect but um, I only use the data from 1960 to uh, 2019, uh, and I factor in for the financial crisis intervention, guarantees, lendings, uh, capital injections, resolutions, rules, asset management, and other uh, financial crisis intervention uh, means. And uh, here you can see that especially China, uh, the US, China, and Russia, again, uh, are countries uh, that have really the best starting ground on raising uh, large-scale funds in order uh, to, to alleviate uh, financial crises. When I also only zoom in into the actual uh, financialization of crisis uh, mitigation and adaptation, uh, I created this resilience finance index again out of the metric uh, Schmelzig uh, database. And uh, hereby, I only looked into the guarantees, lending, and capital injections. And here you see again China and the US, but Russia and also Russia have uh, the really uh, are well established in raising funds in order to uh, to alleviate crises. And uh, therefore, I argue uh, the these countries um, could could uh, have the best starting ground and a higher responsibility to protect the earth uh, and, and help in the redistribution of funds uh, that should happen uh, quite quickly in light of the fast pace of climate change and uh, its, its impact on the earth. And then uh, in the last set uh, in the, of, of uh, the index, um, I also look into bank lending rates. So what countries do have good starting grounds uh, in, in getting funds uh, from uh, global uh, banks like the IMF um, and uh, historically grown bank lending rates are really favorable uh, for uh, China, the US and uh, Russia again. So again, these three uh, powerhouses would have the best starting ground to find a common uh, financialization uh, solution for climate change. And then in the very last set of indices, I also look into what I call finance diplomacy. Um, and this is really uh, the, this idea 
what country has really a good network and historical uh, leadership positions in order to alleviate uh, uh, crises uh, with financial means. And uh, therefore, I also factor in global economic connectivity and international leadership parameters. So in the first index, I want to uh, also address um, that the consumption-based based trade adjusted CO2 emissions. That means uh, that some countries are producing uh, goods and thereby emit a CO2, but this, uh, this, uh, um, uh, these goods are not uh, consumed in these countries. And here you see the role of China really drops um, and a small country in uh, Europe, Switzerland becomes, and the Northern European countries and Canada become really uh, uh, important in finding a solution because they are actually consuming a lot of goods that are produced somewhere else uh, in the world where the CO2 emissions are happening. Um, then I also created this one science. minute. <laughs> I know, and we are down to two indices. I also created okay. this science diplomacy index uh, in which I factored in uh, what countries have a good established network of uh, academics, institutions, and diplomacies. Uh, and here you see the role, the importance of the US and Russia. Uh, so again, these uh, countries that might have uh, political uh, uh, arguments uh, these days, uh, they, uh, they, um, they are, are also have this high responsibility to uh, get their, their um, uh, science diplomacy networks uh, together in order to help alleviate climate change. And in the very last index, um, I also factor in really this uh, global economic connectivity of trade to remittances, foreign direct investments and migration. And here, small European countries like Luxembourg, uh, Switzerland, but also Hungary really uh, seem to have a really good starting ground uh, in order to help move funds that are needed fast uh, around the globe in order to help uh, mitigate and adapt to climate change. And with this, I very much look forward uh, to an interesting discussion and also hear from the audience. Great. Th thanks, Julia. Thanks so much. Um, okay, so uh, now uh, your paper is going to be discussed by uh, Marvin Pokema. Uh So uh, Marvin, do you have your slides or? Oh, great. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, just a little disclaimer. I don't represent the government at all with these uh, discussion points, so I'll just get that out of the way. I um, uh, went through uh, Dr. Pashander's paper, um, just a brief overview of what she just described. Uh, the general framework, from what I could tell is, and this was to get it out there, this is not my field. Um, I'm an agricultural economist, but uh, do find it very intriguing work. Um, uh, the framework, from what I could tell, is to is, uh, estimate a redistributive framework uh, via a set of indices, nine from what I could gather, composed of a variety of leveraged socioeconomic factors, mainly through a taxation bond approach, um, and mostly uh, voluntary pass through at this time, um, nothing enforced either through trade agreements. Uh, or taxation agreement, from what I tell. So there are some fairly complicated mechanisms there that probably still have to be sorted through. I'll let that um, uh, pass through, uh, no pun intended, to the question and answer period for clarification. Um, second part, uh, these factors uh, noted in the papers F1 through F10 include several embedded subvariables which might complicate the interpretation but uh, these are ranked, uh, as we're shown in the slides, by variables by country. So the data science part of this is fairly interesting, depending on how this is aggregated. Um, but they're grouped according to their index purpose. And I think Dr. Pushander kind of uh, alluded to how she thought they were Im uh, important. Um, but um, uh, from what I could tell, they uh, have some relative importance. Um, and then these data sources were normalized. Um, and you know, I think some question could be is does this normalization process maybe uh, impart some bias, uh, perhaps uh, with skewed data sets? Maybe not. Um, um, I don't know. There's, 
I don't work with this field of data, some of it. So um, there is some possibilities there for some questions. Um, uh, this is your field. So I'll just put that as a possible question. But perhaps the more important part here is this design leads to some leverage relationships uh, in the indices because um, as you'll see here in a bit that large numbers will cast outsized um, exponential relationships in their effects. And then the fourth point is that um, most of the data here was uh, sourced uh, through open source data, primarily through, uh, through GitHub, uh, which I think is interesting um, from a data science perspective. Um, from a review perspective, um, I was kind of looking for some, just some base summary statistics of, of the data. So, you know, normally I'm looking for base relationships to kind of explain how everything sort of looks together. Uh, just some summary statistics uh, or relationships just to see how things work together, to sort of support your case uh, and how you're forming the index. Um, and then um, kind of the second, second sort of factor that jumped out at me is sort of the mixing of time periods. So is there a clear um, linkage in, in the data part that linked a like time periods to like time periods? Because I saw several different time periods being used to describe other time periods. So is the time linkage preserved through these disparate um, uh, data sets um, wasn't clear to me. Um, the third thing that uh, jumped out at me is this mathematical identity of this multiplicative factor index is intriguing. So when you see, when you're multiplying numbers together uh, in an index, um, usually how I say in the, the literature and how you use indices is you have weights associated with them. But if you're just straight multiplying, you'll see large numbers, uh, create large numbers in a leveraged effect. And is this being demonstrated either in the literature or, or do you have a mathematical proof of that, um, um, you know, from, from the economics itself, literature um, to demonstrate your case or to prove your case. And so that's kind of what I was looking for here. And so, would the results change in your indices if you're using these relative weights? Or how are you using um, these indices empirically, like applying these kind of in a real world scenario? And then kind of a fourth and a little more subtle, and I use a lot of uh, uh, trade data in my work. And, and when we're doing things in US dollar denominated um, assets, we always have to go back when we go into local uh, economies, uh, that's not US dollar, we have to apply a, a conversion factor uh, because we're dealing with foreign exchange rates. We have to go in and, and reweight or reapply these. And I wasn't seeing that. Maybe I was missing something here. Um, but if we factor this out by local currency effects, uh, would this change the interpretation of this? So th that's kind of the data science part, uh, main data science parts. Uh, that I was seeing. So that's um, that's my review here. So thank you for your time. Oh, great. Thanks, Marvin. Thanks so much. Uh, Julia, did you want to respond uh, just in a minute or so? <laughs> yes, just really quickly. So in the original winners and losers index, I did uh, use a linear prospect and exponential uh, conditions, calculated all three models, and then took the mean uh, in order to address uh, the, the, the problem of uh, exponential model, because we really don't know um, if uh, the gains and losses, how they will be distributing. Um, uh, but but in the other indices, uh, it's it's right. I most of the time used uh, used only uh, a multiplication. Uh, the weighting, uh, I think. Just, I use so many different data sources and it would be so hard over the entire world uh, to, to really think through the weighting. But uh, I have to say um, there, there is at the IMF under uh, the, the uh, uh, former science director, uh, Topalova, there was a working group. I think they did a similar model and they uh, had, I think, 
24 regional experts uh, who were working on a model. And uh, of course, when I heard it, uh, we invited her for a talk and she came and spoke to us at the new school uh, about us in a climate change speaker series. And her model actually, uh, it was uh, interesting because uh, the, the world map uh, looked very similar. So I think the weighting uh, is, is uh, I leave this up to, to people who have better resources, more access and who can really hire 24 uh, economists to work on, on uh, the uh, details. But I don't think the model that is very slim and just focused on uh, some economic factors uh, is, is so wrong uh, if I don't start uh, thinking to, uh, to wait. Uh, for the last uh, part, the, the GitHub data, I'm not sure uh, because I really do use a lot. Uh, most of it is, I think, World Bank IMF data, uh, uh, our world in science data, for instance, for the consumption-based uh, trade adjusted um, perspective. Uh, also, uh, the two indices are pretty much based on on uh, the Yale School of Management uh, metric uh, schmelzing data who really collected, uh, I think, a lot of information from central banks and the Bank of England from archives. So I do uh, I do not think that I only draw uh, GitHub data. I, I'm not even sure uh, where I have the GitHub data. Uh, so, so I think uh, in terms of data, I, I use a bit more of a variety, but I'm always open and really look forward to also discussing with the grant audience. If you have uh, a really interesting ideas how to move uh, this entire project further. I really always love to speak for the Society of uh, Government Economists because I really get real world relative uh, uh, checkups and, and really valuable input on how to move this project further. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Thanks. Okay, uh, we're running a little behind in schedule, so I'm going to have to shorten some of the times as we go. Um, so uh, the next paper is by uh, Ari Rat and her co-authors on data-driven investigation on impact of air quality in uh, different uh, demographics. Uh, so, Arirat? Are you off mute? You're on mute, Arirat. Trying to unmute. Oh, there you go. Okay. Hello, can Okay, all right. Thank you, Steve. And hello, yeah. everyone. And first, I guess I have to press disclaimer as well that I don't represent anybody and any comments or any, or any errors. That would be just my thing. And um, my paper, Data Driven Investigation on Impact of Air Quality in Different Demographics also co-authored by Irina and Lauren and Yelin Lee, who are data scientists. And our goal is to investigate the air quality of different socioeconomic communities in 2020 to see whether there is any disparity pattern that are significant in different communities so that decision on which air pollutant to focus first for each community can be made in a cost effective manner. Um, we will focus on five major air pollutants in the EPA Air Quality Index, which I probably will say AQI a lot of time. And these are regulated by the Clean Air Act, including foul level ozone, particulate matter 2.5, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. I will um, explain more about defining the community uh, later. Uh, for related works, we our forecasting model selection for time series analysis, basic profit, uh, highly discussed in Taylor and Boyton and South et al. And when we look at uh, recent related research work, and they often use the AQI traffic related air pollution of PM 2.5 as a target air pollutant. So what we do is we go into individual export each uh, of the five major uh, information air pollutants in the AQI. And you may also look at related study at the EPA, EPA research page. Um, the data, we first got data from the women in data science and we saw 
which include weather conditions, air pollutants, and demographic features. And we found that 50% of weather conditions and like and benzene pollutants were missing. So we decided to only work with the five main pollutants, which also coincide with the Clean Air Act. And we also try to add more historical data. So we do API call at the EPA ID location to get all the air quality data from 2016 to 2020. Um, then we do feature engineering for the four demographic fraction features that we receive. Um, we found that people of color, low income, linguistically um, isolation and less than high school edition, education are highly correlated. So we have to decide on which one to concentrate. So we pick the first two because they have higher variance. And then we create a um, new uh, feature by taking the arithmetic average of the two. And that come out to be similar to demographic index that defined by the EP. Then we uh, drew all the air monitoring stations into three bins based on the demographic index. Bin one with under 25% of demographic index, which means it has the lowest uh, low income fraction and people of color fraction like, um, that may less than 25%. And then bin two, which is the mid EJ community that will be between 25 to 50%. And bin three EJ, which is above um, 50%. And actually, in our work, we will use 2016 to 2018 as our train data and 2019 as our validation. Then we go to predict 2020 to compare with the actual data. And um, luckily, that the distribution of the three bin between the train and validation and the chest data uh, similar, which um, a good side for us. Um, so for our model selection, we use FB profit because it works better in dealing with time series data with multiple seasonalities, which you will see later, and also with missing data. And uh, it also quick, powerful, and easy to implement in obtaining confident intervals and forecasts. And when in our result with the MB uh, profit, any actual data that is above our 95% confident interval show that that area of the uh, air pollution uh, monitor has a higher higher uh, pollution than usual. If it's below the 95%, then it has lower air pollution than usual. So looking at the result, uh, we actually first explore our data and we use the EPA AQI indication of the level of health concern and uh, the color is actually similar to what the uh, EPA has that uh, goal mean uh, unhealthy for sensitive people, and then red will be unhealthy, where purple would be very unhealthy, and maroon would be positive, positive health. And um, also you could see the disparity between the non-EJ and EJ communities in terms of um, their burden on the air pollution that will cause their health issues. Um, and again, that the distribution show that they are similar, but for the, when we look at very unhealthy and hazardous, um, again, it showed a disparity that the um, EJ community would take more burden. But on, in the 2020, it also searched that the, um, they're not, with EJ community carry burden as well. And when we look at the pattern of changes, and you could see here, it might be a little bit harder to see the red 
um, represent the EJ and then the orange will be the main EJ and the blue will be for the non EJ. And you could see that uh, the EJ community carry more burden for uh, carbon monoxide uh, and PM 2.5 and uh, nitrogen dioxide. Um, all communities seem to carry the ground level also at the same level. And for the sulfur dioxide, it seems that the mid EJ people uh, community carry more burden, but it's coming down during the COVID in 2020. Um, when we look at the profit forecast, you can see that um, for carbon monoxide, have high percentage above the forecast. So that seems like for carbon monoxide, we may have to give priority for all the uh, community. And for, um, for nitrogen dioxide and uh, ground level ozone, this is a little bit kind of a smaller percentage. And when we look at PM2.5, you can see that again at non EJ will have higher above forecast, higher percentage above forecast. So in our discussion, then you know, like figure two, two and three, two and three show the burden that the EJ community carry. And then the table one also indicate that uh, priority um, would be placed to reduce carbon monoxide in our community. Um, but uh, for PM2.5, maybe we might concentrate that on the um, EJ community. And so in our conclusion, in our, um, to help improve health, um, air quality and livelihood for residents in the EJ communities. Maybe we take priority on reducing PM2.5 and carbon monoxide. And for like COVID-19, it's sure that the lockdown um, might have some positive impact in reducing sulfur dioxide. And actually that kind of like in the EJ community, but we may have to explore more of the pattern of the sulfur that oxide pollutants as they have some changing in pattern. So that's all for me. <laughs> uh, thanks, Ira. That's great. That's great. Uh, very interesting. Um, okay, so uh, discussing your paper will be um, Scott uh, Gilbert. Scott, do you have uh, your discussion ready? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, uh, and I'm very glad to be here uh, as uh, in an organization sponsored by AirLeap, the Association for Integrity and Responsible Leadership in Economics and Associated Professions. I've been so glad to be part of uh, past AirLeap uh, conferences or programs, and I'm, I'm keeping it in mind as I provide just a few remarks here today. Uh, first of all, I was just delighted to, to read the paper uh, by Ari Rat and Irina Amari and Jalen Lee. I thought it was a wonderful way to see and actions, some really nice uh, exploratory analysis and descriptions of, uh, you know, an, uh, an important issue, uh, possible um, uh, kind of a disparate impacts of pollution on different uh, parts of our uh, of our society uh, in a very modern uh, sense uh, with a contemporary and even cutting edge technologies in play. So I just was really pleased to be able to read this and, and see it. And I think maybe in the context of, of this group too, um, I was impressed because, well, first it reflects my ignorance, but I didn't know that the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, was giving not only kind of pollution levels, but this detail in terms in terms of kind of um, demographics, uh, you know, poverty, uh, race percentage, and so on, in, in each of the areas in which it monitors pollution levels, and I thought that was just really cool. And in terms of kind of integrity, uh, then with the air leap inspiration, I mean, I kind of like that. And this is a group of government economists or government folks. I like that. I guess about what I'm seeing from the EPA. And this is just me. I, I don't, I'm not uh, allied with it, but I was happy to see as an economist that this appears to be true. That you can get great data apparently on not just what the pollution levels are, but really be able to look at the, uh, you know, the, the justice side of it, um, 
in terms of kind of uh, different uh, impacts on various uh, parts of our society. So I definitely was um, very happy to explore that, to see the, uh, Ari Wright has already shown, but I could just touch upon her, a couple of her slides again. Um, let's see. Yeah, do you want me to change? Yeah, okay. And... You can change. You have that slide. Thanks. And if they don't, if they don't pop up, I'll just move along because she so nicely already actually uh, showed them uh, showed them to us. But if I do put them on screen, if we happen to see them, I thought they were really fascinating. I learned a lot just from looking at them. Uh, in terms of the, uh, I like uh, overall what they say and some curiosities. So just as Aria touched upon, it was kind of weird. I thought that amongst the very unhealthy, uh, you know. Um, uh, those that are in the very unha unhealthy and uh, in a big way uh, groups was kind of this middle bin between those that are poor and uh, and, and more more uh, minority and those that are uh, you know uh, suburbs or you know white and uh, and least but minority probably so what was going on here with that middle bin and in the center I was just curious I was wondering about it it inspires me to think more about this but the overall trend I love the the visual presentation that shows that if these bins are again, uh, not socially disadvantaged up to socially most advantaged. Oh, my goodness. I mean, there is, you know, a great disparity illustrated here in terms of uh, the concentration of these kinds of, you know, pollutants. So I, I love the descriptive, descriptive and exploratory uh, content there. Uh, and I love the dynamics that was shown here. Uh, you know, the timeline would have been 2017 to 2020 but just how those things and the loops and so on with the seasonal patterns uh, of the data, which she alludes to as well. And that inspires her use of this kind of cutting edge uh, forecasting tool as uh, what I thought was very innovative and thoughtful, um, you know, and made the One case minute, for me. Scott. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And the last thing is, I, I would say is I didn't even know uh, uh, really about this uh, amazing tool that is available, this this forecasting tool. Uh, I played around with it. Uh, it's available to all you government economists. Another thing, great transparency here. You can use it for <laughs> free, uh, as Ari Rath had, uh, if you were to go and, and download it in R, for example. I imagine I pulled up the screen where about eight, loads, eight lines of R code and you get this incredible forecast with the confidence bands. So I thought it was really neat that this paper adopted that. Uh, and then kind of the takeaway was maybe that those, uh, those uh, um, I think so societies that were uh, areas of our country that were reasons outside of that you know, prediction range were, you know, there was some disparity across these different uh, demographic groups, not as much as I had thought, but I thought that was fascinating. I haven't seen that before. You have a baseline of a forecast, and then you look at the groups that were just extraordinary in some way, too high or too low, as a way of evaluating as well, kind of surprises, if you like, surprise or shocks uh, to different groups in our society that would be associated with here pollution. So I was fascinated, I was uh, intrigued, and I was encouraged that I could do this kind of stuff too using this profit uh thing from facebook that it has academic background it was published an article on it in task the american statistician i'm an associate editor for that journal i didn't even know it was there i'm so glad i know that now and i'll look to it more in some of my own work possibly in the future so thanks very much Ari Rath and co-authors thanks so much scott very interesting thanks so much okay so now yeah uh yeah Ari Rath, i think we're gonna have to skip uh your you know rebuttal kind of thing because we're really behind is that okay okay <laughs> i'm sorry i gotta keep us rolling because i'm sure that everybody's been waiting with their questions and i don't want to cut them out at the end so uh brian uh are you there for your presentation on the fourth paper long short-term memory approach to forecast the macroeconomic impacts of covid19 on g12 countries so, Maybe if you could stop sharing and then uh, Brian can try. Hey, Brian. Uh, you got to you got to get off mute. You yes, get I, mute. I'm here. Oh. I'm still doing okay. the take me off of a screen sharing thing. Okay. Now you're on. Okay. Uh, let me go find the presentation. Can I check my head on? Mm 
Let's see there's some there. Okay, meter's running, Brian. <laughs> oh, there it is. Uh, it's kind of a pain in the neck, but oh well. Uh, okay. All right. Gary, you got it. Okay, yep. here we go. Yes, there we go. So, so I guess the first thing is um, it's kind of a little bit the title's a little bit different from the paper that it's giving in the the program. But um, so I will just um, proceed onwards. So the objective is we want to look at the effects of inflation. So on 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 the macroeconomics of G20 country, especially after the effects of the global pandemic. So we use time series data. We have lots of time series data. And then we, we were using forecasting methods through LSTM, long-term, short-term memory approach. And then we did a comparative analysis using the long-term, short-term memory approach versus the extreme gradient boosting or XG boost approaches, as it's normally called in the literature, to show the possible downturns in the economies. So the outline of the presentation is background, some methodology, empirical results, and conclusion and summary. The methodology is a little hot and heavy, so I'm just going to glance through it. And if you want, I can send you some more later, if you wish. So what's the background for this topic? So it's kind of like global 19 is still, the pandemic is still looming in the global sense. And um, as we all know that the US and global economic activity fell sharply in July, 2022. So according to purchasing managers, there's, and they still do today, with the still risk of inflation as well as continued disruption from the Ukraine war. And now we can probably throw in the, the situation with the balloon from China kind of thing, but uh, that's a possibility as well. But the Eurozone economy has been hit by the fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, contributing to higher energy, good prices have weakened, household spending declined, and is threatening their business profit margin. But the European Central Bank, for the first time in 11 years, increased last year, half percentage point, and they just did so again last week. So they're trying to get their inflation pressures under control as well. And then if so, there will probably likely increase interest rates and probably the Fed will continue to do so as well, even though inflation has been kind of reduced in, um, in the last few months. So how does it contribution to the literature? So this paper follows the strand of the literature that examine the effects of financial and political crises. There are a whole bunch of papers there. And then we want to, and then Yorda 2020 examined the low frequency economic consequences of the pandemic, but he always focused on the real rates of return. But everyone keeps talking about this recession thing. So if it should be avoided, but we don't know. It could be attributed that U.S. consumers and firms are still robust and help. So specifically, household balance sheets are probably still pretty strong. And as we know, the labor market continues to boom. So the unemployment rate fell, as indicated last Friday, to 3.4% after creating 500,000-something 500, 500, jobs. Encouragingly, we're seeing some in cooling down in inflationary pressure without any macroeconomic weaknesses. So then the job market continues to boom as well. So, and that's what's going to happen. And then, so is the Fed still going to increase their interest rates? Well, they probably will, but probably at a much slower pace. So more important, so in order to look at the negative effects of the pandemic, and the post-pandemic economic issue, the government implemented policies to contain all these crises. So, and then another aspect of the literature looked at them, um, identified here, they proposed a strong fiscal response to help con contain the impact of COVID-19. And there's this growing literature about how do we respond to COVID-19. And I have some, uh, 
items here from the literature that talk about that, you know, or how do they contain it? And then, then uh, now we look at the methodology and data sources. So the data included that we identified is real GDP, industrial production, unemployment rate, retail sales, stock market, inflation, and Fed funds rate. And then we did everything from January 95 to July 2022 monthly data. So I'm trying, so he and I are still work, working on the updates for this, that we're going to extend the time monthly time series out a little bit more. All our data came from tradingeconomics.com. Just write a little R code and API, and then boom, you get your data. And then we applied the API data for all G20 countries. So as part of the long-term, short-term memory the methodology, we used um, the extreme gradient boosting, the forecasting. So the motivation for LSTM, because our data is time series. Most economists don't do this LSTM stuff. A lot of it is done in like engineering. We might see a little bit creeping into economics, but not very much. So we like to see the impact of past values as incorporated in the current values of the variables that were involved. So really, where LSTM is some type of RNN, we're having alphabets today, so recurrent neural network. So really, all of that the LSTM is kind of like an advanced version of RNN, which is a sequential network that shows information to persist. It can handle the vanishing gradient problem that they aren't faced by RNN. So what, what the heck does all this mean in plain English? Well, let's say you're watching a video, you remember the previous theme, or while reading a book, you know what happened earlier in the earlier chapter. That's kind of like what RNN does. It kind of goes back and kind of remembers what was done in the past. They remember the previous information and they use it for processing the current information. That's sort of how it works intuitively. So the shortcoming of RNN, it can't remember the long-term dependency because of the, the, uh, the vanishing gradient problem. So that becomes, so we have to figure out what to do for that. So, so what's going to happen now is LTM, LSTM consists of three parts. Each part performs an individual function. So the first part chooses where we got the information from the previous time is to be remembered or is irrelevant and can be forgotten. The second part tries to deal with new information from the input to the cell. And the last part, the cell passes all the updated information from the current one to the next one. So well, these three parts are known as gates in LSTM, the forget gate, the second gate is the input gate, and the last one is the output gate. And then the hidden state is, is represented by HT minus one, it's the hidden state of the previous time period or timestamp, and then HT is the hidden state of the current timestamp. So it, it's, it's very elaborate in methodology, so I kind of just presented it in a very rough sense. So and then, so there's more details, but I omitted them for the sake of time. So the scalable machine learning system for tree boosting is known as extreme gradient boosting algorithm. It's a very popular algorithm to use, and it can officially examine all of the input features. It's reliable and efficient machine learning problem solving. But keep in mind, all these methods here, long-term, short-term memory stuff, is really, it's, it's a sub, it's called part of deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning. And then we can handle missing values, prevent overfitting. We have parallel and distribution calculation methods to help reduce the running time. So if you, if there's a lot more details, which I did not elaborate on. So if you want more, just let me know. So we forecasted of selected values and shows some interesting results. So the summary shows the efficacy of the forecasting model, and we have them here. We only highlighted some of them because there's a lot of output that are going to be used. We have it for Indonesia, Brazil, J Japan, South Africa, and the United States. And then we have the MSE and the root mean square error for both the the SGB, the gradient boosting thing, and versus LSTM. 
And we can see some of the models here that we identified. So those are kind of like the better ones that we've seen in the empirical results that we estimated. So again, we didn't show all of it because we had to save space and time. So the results that we have there is that, that we identified show that more the robustness of the forecasting model is probably a bit better with XGBoost than LSTM. There are no ways to exactly measure efficacy, so we just use root mean square error for that, and it shows how well it fits the data. So the assumption is that the mean square error, or even the root mean square error, is more robust than the model is. So, and then the variation could be smaller using XGBoost and forecasting models using LSTM to be, seems to be pretty acceptable if we're dealing with outliers in different countries of the G20. So here's one. So here's the predicted values. I'm going to move this. And then so we, so we could kind of like recall everything together and a kind of robustness. So what is this graph telling us? We're, so that figure indicates there's a difference between the actual and predicted values of GDP using the XGBoost than in the LSTM. We have more slides on that. But regarding future forecasts, it shows a decreasing trend in GDP growth rate. Three minutes, Brian. And so and then the LSTM model kind of showed a more negative one. Here is the US GDP for versus the actual values of the model and then the predicted values. So the lower average forecast of GDP can be accounted for in the U.S. And then, ironically, XG boosting LSTM forecasted growth rate shows a negative growth rate in both because there's a vast rebounding showing a positive growth thereafter. So we have negative and then it becomes positive again. In Japan, it's probably a bit more favorable because they have the average growth rate for zero to two percent. And then... But the forecasted GDP growth rate showed a positive slowdown thereafter. So it kind of slows down, as we can see in here. It kind of slows Japan, Japanese GDP. There's lots of more uh, interesting results that we can show, but for time. So we have another one that I want to look at is um, South Africa has less than 1% growth in both XGBoost and LSTM. If we stay above a negative level, but it's not considered ro as robust as other countries, so we kind of just uh, selected 20 countries, so it's nothing stay the same. So, because there's many other results that we have, so that's kind of, we discussed some of them in a paper and have like comparative table. So we kind of think we did a pretty decent job. We contributed to the literature in some way. So we have to expand the time series from July, 2022 and expand it maybe January, 2023. And show some good, interesting, deep learning approaches to a problem that's iterative algorithm. And then these are used to help find the best result. It's an algorithm method so, and from deep learning. So we obtain the results several times, then we select the most optimal one. It's the iteration that minimizes all the error terms. And that's where the root mean square error and uh, SME comes into play. So yeah, one minute. iteration okay. helps the model be transformed into some more productive model that could be used for forecasting. And then you can read this slide really fast so I can get out of the way. So I am now done. Great. Thanks so much, Brian. Very, very interesting. Okay, so uh, our final uh, discussion for the final paper is uh, Sandeep uh, Sarika. Uh, Sandeep, are you ready? Yes, I am. Can you okay. hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you for inviting me to discuss this paper. I really like the paper. I really enjoyed <laughs> reading this one. And very timely paper very recent methodologies so thank you for that uh, i think uh, you did a great job in uh, uh, using that machine learning technique to try to estimate gdp or whether we are going to see a recession or not so i'm not a machine machine learning person so the 
review I'm going to do right now, uh, that is mostly part of the paper where I had difficulty understanding it. So, so I don't have any slides or anything, but uh, one of the thing I would like to see in the paper is that what is the theoretical background? So what is the theoretical relationship between let's say inflation and uh, <clears throat> inflation and GDP or inflation and uh, uh, business cycle? So that discussion, that would be great. So that would motivate me like why we are uh, <clears throat> reading this paper. Then <clears throat> few more like a uh, <clears throat> few more uh, justification about why you are using XG boost. Like there are other models like random forest uh, or <clears throat> I'm sure there might be other machine learning models which could be used. So, so if you, <clears throat> I know you you talked about like XGBoost does it overfit the model and other reasons, but maybe if you could feed the data with different machine learning models and compare like how uh, how they compare, so that would be great. Um, then uh, about data, like uh, one of the like why are you choosing those variables? So what are the rationalities or what it, what are the theoretical uh, literature about those? So if you could explain that, so that would be uh, that would be easier for me to read. So I'm pretty, I guess you are uh, you are middle of writing this paper, so I'm, I know probably you'll, you'll put more thought when the final version comes out. Uh, a few a few notes about editing. So I'd like to see a few more references. For example, uh, in section two, you talk about causes of recession. So you talked about four different causes of recession. So if you can add some more references and uh, like what are <clears throat> uh, and what are the like theoretical reasons behind those causes. So that would be great. So that is one thing. Uh, in some places, you need to be more specific. Like when you are talking about something, for example, like uh, um, in the data section, you said you are using data from countries like then you named like four or five countries ABC. So, um, so if you can tell us like what specific countries you are looking at, that would be great. Uh, one thing I was. Uh, wondering like why did you choose selected countries not all the g20 countries so that is another thing uh, <clears throat> few suggestion about uh, editing like uh, it probably you need to add some access label or titles to some of your figures and tables so one minute yeah i think i'll keep it short so so that brian has some time to respond to my question, so yeah. Oh, great. No, thanks, uh, Sandy. So, um, okay, at this point, I believe we're ready to take questions. Now, this is a big crowd, so I don't know uh, how easily I can do this. I can try to look to see if hands are raised. Um, so far, I don't see any hands raised. Um, uh, does anybody want to just... Uh, start asking a question then <laughs> uh can we take everybody off mute maybe that that might help sabrina can are you there to uh, anybody if they have the cap capability of coming off mute uh that would be good i keep i have i have people on two pages here i keep flipping back i don't see any questions um Everybody should be able to unmute themselves. Okay, please unmute yourself and uh, and ask a question if you have one, please. To any for any of the paper presenters on any of the four papers. Uh, Jake. Hi, Jake. I see that you 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 got lit up there, but I don't know. 
Um, it, uh, oh, sorry, no question. All right. Um, what we could do is um, I prevented Ari Rat and uh, Brian from commenting back on their papers. So why don't we uh, why don't we start? Uh, Ari Rat, would you like to comment back on the review of your paper? Actually, for some reason, my battery is running low. So even if I get some point, but, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Scott for the review and actually to bring what, I mean, to explain what I do better, actually, <laughs> in terms of like um, how you say pitch. Are you going to bring something up or something? Oh, are you, ready? are you getting ready or something to respond? I got a little frozen there. While we're waiting, uh, Brian, did you want to respond to the comments on your paper? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think I think the I think the comments are valuable, but I, I think the only the um I think one of the big things that um we need to kind of go back and kind of figure out you know what are the actual causes of the of recession that actually occur, you know. This one might be kind of different than it might be compared to past ones, perhaps. We don't know. And then probably mm -hmm. the other thing is um considering there's been lots of changes that have occurred in the last few months, maybe um I mean some people might disagree with this, but it might be a good idea to kind of expand the time series and see what kind of results we get now given the circumstances that we have because now that we have newer information i think stan dipper might agree with that too correct yeah so he agrees too so i have to kind of convince um rolando how to uh to pursue something like that and then uh, <laughs> I, was, I was having a bit of a hard time on zoom because of the i was having a hard time understanding and I wasn't, it's not stand if I was having a hard time with, I think it was something on Zoom. Zoom was not acting properly. So I think what I'll probably do is I'll have to send an email later today asking stand up for some, his comments. So, I, so we can okay. so address him in the paper. Okay. I, I see that uh, Azza has a question, okay. uh, hand up. Uh, Azza? Yes, hello everyone. So uh, my question is for Brian, uh, for your model, of your forecast model, did you try to compare the forecastability of your model against some uh, baseline model like the random walk or random walk or with a drift? Are you like comparing the root mean square error of, uh, of your model against those kind of models? Um, yeah, I, if we did have some baseline models that we kind of compared them to, but we didn't add it into the paper because he was very stubborn about that. So we kind of did. So I should kind of convince him maybe we should add some more on baseline models, but you're right about that. And also, I have a question. I noticed that the, predict uh, the predicted line for the US um, GDP was like different, very much different than the the one obtained from your model. So can you explain why that? Oh, can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Um, there is a graph in your presentation where you present the US uh, GDP versus the one you obtained, the predicted one. Yes. And it was very much different. I mean, one was like uh, increasing, the variability is not the same in post, uh, in post right. uh, time series. Mm -hmm. So can you explain about that? Um, he and I have been trying to ponder on that. And um, so we have to kind of go back and figure out why that's kind of occurring. So, but that's a good point that you raised. Okay, thank you. Oh, thanks. Ryan, I like the way that uh, any tough questions you refer back to your co-author as- <laughs> I, don't <laughs> want to say, I don't want to say the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, I see that uh, Marvin uh, has his hand up. Marvin, did you have a question? 
Sure, I'm, I'm real fascinated by Brian's model. I, I do a lot of time series work as well. And I'm just curious how it compares, you know, structurally to let's say a vector dot of regression or, or REMA, um, like how you handle the, the error terms kind of in and out, as well as how does it compare, let's say to a, like a Markov chain process? Cause it looks structurally similar, but I'm just curious how, how it compares. Did, did you say something, did you mention something on the REMA model? Yeah, like how how you oh, okay. how how oh. compare contrast how you handle the error. Term. Oh, okay. Uh, we did not use a we we didn't use a REMA model to see how it would compare to that. So I think that's a good point that maybe we could see how it compared to a REMA and see what what it looks like. And um, but um, I know Rolando for some. I mean, we talked about Arima once before, and he's now overly crazy about it. He he always said it's ancient history when it comes to time series. <laughs> so, so, so I think that's probably why he kind of like shied away from that. But I think it's something that we should revisit. Yes. I was even just though, even even though even though it's considered ancient history in um, time series, but it's still probably a good it's way to to look at things comparatively. Well, I was just more interested how it compared, like how, because I didn't see the error term in the equation, so I was mm -hmm. concerned how that was. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, I, I'm not used to hearing that one econometric model is less preferred because it's not on the charts anymore, but it's... <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I could, I could hold in that little snickering thing. Um, anyway, uh, any other questions that we have from anybody? Uh, I, I had a, uh, a quasi silly question for Julia. Um, so, <laughs> so as I understood some of your your graphs, um, uh, because Russia kind of like benefits from climate change they would then uh, be on the hook to compensate the other countries that were suffering from climate change. So um, uh, do you envision uh, Russia <laughs> making payments to, uh, to you know, to, I, I guess it's all theoretical, but, you know, um, I, I don't know uh, uh, how, how much we can uh, count on Russia to, uh, you know, through the generosity of its kindness of its heart to, you know, reimburse countries that are suffering from climate change. But just a thought, I don't know if you had a, a yes, comment Thank on you that. so much. This is exactly <laughs> why I love to present at the Society of Government Economists, because I always get the real uh, world relevant uh, <laughs> reality check. Um, and of course, yes, um, but this was exactly the reason why I started doing these different indices in order to show different facets of how we could frame um, a redistribution um, uh, uh, like responsibility. Uh, but of course, we we would need uh, first a, a, a global consensus uh, and then uh, the legal means and then also creative uh, economic uh, means how to really uh, fund uh, these uh, these uh, redistribution mechanisms. I do have uh, exactly for this reason, uh, these diplomacy um, uh, factors in, I have the, the global economic leadership uh, also factored in because we did have uh, in the past really um, um, uh, powerful nations also uh, setting a, a global agenda on how to redistribute uh, other funds before uh, when you think about uh, the European Union, uh, the response to the 2008 uh, crisis. Uh, so you, we, we do have historic examples uh, where we could use economic <laughs> incentives uh, despite political uh, uh, discrepancies in order to move funds very quickly. And this is exactly the reason 
reason why I uh, faced in uh, um, yeah factors like science diplomacy, uh, uh, international leadership, uh, trade balances, remittances, uh, in order to really highlight uh, these uh, these factors. Um, if you uh, or someone in the audience has uh, better uh, ideas what to factor in or what was wrong, I have to admit some of the indices really were created because I really got excellent feedback. Uh, someone once said to me, wait a second, you cannot just uh, think about the CO2 emissions, you also have to uh, weed out who is consuming this. Uh, so if you have uh, interesting ideas, uh, what, what else should be reflected, this is really an ongoing project. And uh, I think it is really uh, highly relevant when you look at where we stand with uh, the UNF uh, C negotiations every year. Last year, for, uh, like uh, two years ago, we had this consensus, we need redistribution. And this year we really stood at so who should have a higher responsibility uh, to to help in the redistribution? Oh, I have a question. Yeah, interesting. I have a question yeah. for Julia too about that. Sure, go ahead. Um, I mean, uh, in um, in labor, we're kind of looking at climate change and how it impacts worker safety issues and all that. And uh, they and there's this there's this guy at University of Pennsylvania. He's done some work on it. Can't remember his name, Mr. Park. Doctor, whatever, and he's um he's looking at the he developed it the econometric model using um what's that data called it's the compensation data you know if you if you get hurt on the job California worker compensation worker data side, yeah yeah so he he was using that in his econometric model looking at the impacts of heat on uh, injuries health and um, even weight labor inequality so. Uh, if you want, I can send you his uh, information on our papers. You can kind of see where his econometric model is. Then on top of that, that was only for California. Then he's working with some guy at a BLF. I can't remember his name. And they're getting uh, nitty gritty data too to do the same thing for the whole country, for the whole US. So if you, if you send me an email later, I can probably send you the stuff because I know I'll forget five minutes after the session. So. Yes, yes, thank you so much. This is a, a, an excellent suggestion. I think I had in one of the previous uh, models, I, I factored in into industry and service sector, really, the, there's, uh, there's literature on the peak condition, what is the temperature oh, yeah. where people are the most productive, and it's it's obviously not when it's too cold, and obviously not when it's too hot. Um, um, good. Because one of the research questions that we were, had to, we were dealing with, if we had... Uh, or if heat was rising or there's climate change, how does that affect workers if, if workers' productivity if they take additional rest breaks? But the literature on that is is absolutely, there's not a whole lot on that, you know, how you affect productivity on workers and how, how is it impacted? There is something, and also uh, the ILO in in Europe, in Italy. I think they are doing they are doing something. Yeah. I spent in the summer. I spent some time there, and I think they are modeling uh, something something on that as well. Definitely, uh, but it is also uh, it's also risk factors. And once it gets very cold, people have more car accidents. So it's it's very right. hard to really measure productivity uh, uh, based on on temperature. For human beings, and then but and there's different ways to measure temperature too. Exactly. There's the WGBT, and there's the other ways. So you have to be very careful in how you measure temperature. That's all. So if you look in the climate change literature, it's like people gripe and complain about how you actually measure heat and temperature. So that becomes a big sticking point as well. So. That, yes. that's, one, that's always been some of the gripes that people have been saying about those kinds of studies. How do you measure temperature? And I think the guy in California, not California, University of Pennsylvania, and then the, and the guy he's working with, the BLS, I think they're trying to address that issue as well, how to measure temperature. You know, yeah. 
Yes, it, it, there's also this um, uh, the, the 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 weather has an impact. Mm -hmm. So there are these interesting effects. If the weather is too nice, uh, then people are not so productive. Uh, so so people tend to be uh, more productive when it's raining uh, because they mm -hmm. cannot do something outdoors. <laughs> but then they get unhappy if they are too. Low, they are more happy and they they are more conscientious when they spend time in the outdoors. So that there, there, there are all these economic trade-offs. Uh, do you want to have bad weather to be productive, or do you want Want to enjoy your life uh, in in the sunshine outside, uh, so we do uh, we do have uh, this uh, condition of these behavioral effects as well. Another really uh, what I would love to see more in economic models would be this uh, climate flexibility. The more temperature zones a country has, and congratulations based on my model uh, that it takes peak temperatures. The U.S. is the country with the highest climate flexibility. The more trade oh, yeah. assets you have, uh, mm -hmm. because you can you can grow different crops and offer different services uh, at the same time. Uh, and I would love to see more on on uh, this climate wealth of nations in economic modeling as well. Yeah, that's true. Uh, if you remind me later, I'll, I'll send you the, the those two people wrote two uh, proper English here. Two researchers work on that kind of. <laughs> yeah, uh, I just find it interesting that uh, you know economists are struggling about how to measure temperature, but you know stuff like human happiness that's easy to measure. So anyway. <laughs> Well, it's not so much temperature, it's like humidity, too, when you're factoring the humidity. That oh, makes, yeah. yeah. That makes, so 85 degrees with zero humidity is not going to be the same as 85 degrees at 100% humidity. Maybe that's a bit extreme, but, so I think that's yeah. where, like, the WG well, kind of, uh, kind of, you uh, have to worry uh, about all this humidity stuff, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, okay, I don't, you know, not that I like to always throw in wrinkles, the thing is, the you know, the worse the temperature is, the more likely the worker will be in a put in a climate controlled situation. So if if, if it's an area where you know it's rel relatively temperate and somebody is working in a piece of uh, machinery like an excavator in construction or something like that, they're going to be exposed to whatever the temperature is. But if they're in a climate that is very, very hot or very cold, there's a much more likelihood that the cabin that they're in is going to have air conditioning <laughs> or heat, in which case it would be more, you know, so there's, you know, it's kind of like uh, there's a lot going on with these things, you know. So, I, think you know. In, I think in California, under their, their heat standard there, is they require something like little boots or like tents so at the job site. So you go into the tent it's going to have like air conditioning and drinking water. And you have to stay in there for a certain amount of time before you go back out to work. And you have to do that like, uh, if I remember. You mean for migrant time. workers? Yes. For migrant outside, 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 agriculture. Outside, yeah. yes, yes, Not right. for economists working in an office. Right? No, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> nice joke there. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry. All right. No, yeah, that's for true. The, the people who work outside, you know, you go and you work, at, you go into these sort of cooling towers cooling booth and have water and air conditioning you stay in there for so much from length of time go out and you work again so and then but you only work for like an hour and then you go back in again yeah um i'll keep looking for ari red but she didn't return i had a question on her paper <laughs> but uh, none of her co-authors are here either i don't think um Anyone else have any questions? Um, oh, Marvin no. said in the chat her computer ran out of battery. Oh, okay. Um, maybe she just didn't want any tough questions. I, think. <laughs> well, yeah. I have to think of that too. We have to write present a paper to come. Hey, the computer's out of battery. Sorry. Uh, uh, Oh, Willie, I mean, um, I don't mean to keep harping on you on this, but uh, is there any plans to, you know, maybe you can corner some USCS economist on the street and, and, <laughs> and say, hey, you know, we want some better data. Is there any kind of, I mean, you've got so much there, you've given it, you've practically 
you know, done their homework for them. Um, but if, you know, you know, you can't, a horse can't drink unless you lead it to water kind of thing. I mean, is there a way to, you know, uh, maybe get some kind of response from them if, they, if they're willing to provide these things or something? That's I'm just throwing a, that out. That's you know. a wonderful, wonderful question. And by the way, your your points about privacy were also really critical and, and very valuable. Everything was valuable. No, um, I happen to know the head of USCIS. I see him every year at the demography meetings. Oh, we've, there you go. We've been in a session together. We're friendly. Um, I think maybe a, I'm I'm one of those people who holds a paper back until every footnote is right and there's <laughs> no question left about anything. Uh, but yes, I am certainly going to send it to him. And I'm also giving uh, this paper again at the demography meetings, PAA, in April. So oh, great. you are absolutely right. Uh, I know exactly the person to see. Um, and, and, and we'll go from there. But yeah. uh, thank you for bringing that up. No, thanks. I mean, you know, what I would do, I mean, there's a couple, of, I don't want to keep harping on it, but we got, we got you know, a couple of minutes. Uh, you know, maybe uh, if you could invite him to be the discussant of the paper, <laughs> and, you know, in front of a large 